afternoon or good noontide. This is Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii on a cloudy, just about to be sunny, Monday, February 1st, 2021. So far, 2021, pretty gosh darn good here. So my guest today is the distinguished managing director of Blue Planet Hawaii, which may be the most active environmental group in the entire state of Hawaii. I'm sure Melissa would uh, not argue with that. And we're going to talk about generally what Blue Planet is doing to get us toward 100% carbon free by the year 2045, unless you have moved that uh, needle, Melissa. So welcome to Melissa Miyashiro, Managing Director. Go ahead, uh, Melissa. Yeah, thank you, Howard. I, I really enjoy uh, chatting with you about clean energy and energy efficiency um, and all things related to climate. So thank you so much for having me on the show to chat a little bit about Blue Planet and what we've been up to and what we have mm -hmm. on the horizon. Yep. Um, I, so I was oh, thinking about oh, maybe oh. just starting. Sorry, Howard. Go ahead. Yeah. Great. Um, this is fun to do this on Zoom, although I miss the, the in-studio, uh, but someday we'll be back. Um, but yeah, I thought I could start by just sharing a little bit about Blue Planet uh, for folks that aren't familiar with our work. Um, you're absolutely right that we always have a lot, of, a lot going on. Um, we're a small team, but we work really hard to create a big impact because we're motivated um, by doing something to, to tackle the climate crisis. Um, and we really believe that Hawaii is a special place uh, that can lead the world in global, global climate solutions. Um, so that really motivates us. So we're a 501c3 nonprofit um, founded in Hawaii. Um, we're about 13 years old. Um, and our focus is really on shaping policy, uh, recognizing that you know some of the challenges that we face are systemic, and we really need to address issues at, at the policy level. Um, and then the other side is really our community-facing work and activating the community in the journey to 100% clean energy. And we uh, love to do that through creative storytelling campaigns and really believe in the power of, of story and um, finding unique messengers um, because this transition to 100% clean energy is really um, about all of us. It's not just something that the something for the utility to think about or something for the state energy office to think about. It's, it's really about, about everyone. And that's what we try to do at Blue Planet. Thank you, Melissa. And that phrase, shaping policy, sounds less than fascinating, but you and I know that it's absolutely key and it's not an abstract word. It gets translated into the real world real good. Please give us some examples of shaping policy. Yeah, there's so many, and it's one of our favorite things to do um, at Blue Planet. Uh, so probably the most uh, prominent example is Hawaii's law that requires that 100% um, of our electricity come from renewable sources by 2045. Um, so that you know idea uh, started many years ago, um, but it started through a, a piece of legislation that Blue Planet was champion championing at the legislature um, beginning in 2013, and it's something that we continue to bring back to, to lawmakers um, and, and really try to bring community voices um, behind that bill to show lawmakers that this is something um, that the community wants for its future. So um, through, you know, talking with lawmakers and then also through grassroots activities where we're, uh, you know, bringing students into the conversation um, and getting different voices from the community, we were, were successful. Um, in passing legislation in 2015 that made Hawaii the first state in the country uh, to set 100% renewable energy target. Um, and now, as you know, Howard, um, mm -hmm. nearly half a dozen states have um, followed Hawaii's lead and set 100% renewable mm -hmm. energy target. Um, but yeah. Hawaii was the first. Yep. And usually California prides itself on being the first in all things environmental, but they follow little old uh, Hawaii. And then yeah. other states uh, followed suit. 
But you said 100% clean electrical energy. Do we have our site set on anything besides electrical energy? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, and certainly Blue Planet does. And I think many others in the state recognize that you know, the electricity system is just one uh, piece of uh, the puzzle when we're talking about decarbonizing. A large uh, portion of our emissions uh, comes from the ground transportation sector and then also aviation. So transportation generally is something that um, actually, you know, Hawaii has a, a ways to go. And uh, you were just talking about kind of California stepping up and leading the way on, on um, environmental policies. And they've really done that with respect to transportation. Um, you may have seen the announcement, um, the governor of California committed to um, banning the sale of new gasoline powered vehicles by 2035. Um, so that's actually a policy proposal that's been considered in Hawaii, um, but, but hasn't passed. There has been conversation around setting a target for 100% renewable ground transportation. So a similar target to what we have on the electricity side. Um, and, and the value of setting a target like that is that you know, stakeholders can then come together um, and, and plan and strategize um, and coordinate around achieving that target uh, rather than it just being more piece, piecemeal um, and you know, it taking a, a, a longer time. So that's something that we um, we absolutely hope to see, particularly with this uh, the current legislative session um, that that just kicked off and is just getting started. There's a lot of opportunity to set policy frameworks for um, decarbonizing the transportation sector. And we can't do it without the cooperation of the private sector. There's a teeny little corporation. I believe still in Detroit called General Motors. Has General Motors had anything to say about this uh, very recently? Yes, um, there was actually a big announcement from them mm -hmm. that they are um, committing um, in just a little, a little over a decade to um, only sell zero emission vehicles. Um, so this was, you know, it's something that we've we've been hearing about manufacturers really betting big. Um, on this conversion to electric vehicles and electric transportation. Um, but this was one of the, the biggest announcements that we've seen to date and, mm -hmm. and really, really solidifies in a public way um, that, that, that this transition um, is underway. So it's really exciting to see and it brings up all kinds of questions about um, you know, whether Hawaii's ready for um, all those new electric vehicle models um, to come onto the market, particularly um, you know, is our charging infrastructure adequate um, to handle everybody converting to electric vehicles? Well, the uh, new, I'm, I'm calling it a new Department of Energy US, I would, the department isn't new, but its emphasis or its shift, its focus has become new in the last uh, month or so. And one of the initiatives is to get out thousands and thousands pay for it. thousands and thousands of electric vehicle charging stations and I did a little math for little old Hawaii and that translated I believe into hundreds of charging stations to be installed by uh, uh, complements of uh, U.S. Department of Energy. Yeah that's really promising to see and it also just mm -hmm. reminds us um, you know, in, in Hawaii, how far we have to go with building out our charging infrastructure. Um, so right now, you know, folks that live in single family homes, um, it's quite easy for them to install a charger so that they can ch charge their electric vehicle at home. Um, but so many of our residents in Hawaii uh, live in multifamily dwellings um, and don't have that easy access to charging at home. Um, so then they're, they're left, and I, I speak from personal experience here, um, they're left with, uh, you know, relying on the public charging network um, that is just very uh, early in its kind of build out stage. Um, so there really isn't enough public charging available for residents um, to encourage them to make the leap to uh, an electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. 
And don't, don't we see a problem here? Let's assume that the evolution towards electric vehicles is in fact, or will soon in fact become a revolution. Fast charging, pun, pun intended, but what's gonna happen to poor old Hawaiian electric company? How is it gonna handle all this massive new demand? Yeah, I think that that is is really exciting, exciting to think mm -hmm. about. And I think it's something that Hawaiian Electric um, is thinking hard about um, and excited about kind of stepping into the, the future, um, particularly with, um, you know, smart charging and dynamic charging. So there's a lot of opportunities to really coordinate our transition to 100% uh, renewable electricity uh, with this transition to clean transportation. So ensuring that we are um, you know, charging electric vehicles at, uh, in the middle of the day when um, you know, a, abundant solar um, is coming onto the grid and really being smart about how, um, about how we're charging. So there's a lot of opportunities um, to, to you know, uh, restructure and play with that two-way conversation, the way that electric vehicles uh, communicate with the uh, electricity grid um, and vice versa. So that, that's something that uh, we know Hawaiian Electric is, is thinking about and utilities across the country um, are thinking about that kind of two-way mm -hmm. um, communication with electric vehicles, which are essentially batteries on wheels, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And that brings up another wincy topic, namely storage. One of my colleagues in the energy office is helping with the permitting of a huge storage farm. What in the world is a storage farm? Could you elucidate that? Yeah, so this is one, I'm, I'm glad that you brought this up because all of these solutions are part of what we see as a holistic uh, mm -hmm. picture of what 100% renewable energy looks like, right? So there's a lot of different um, and a diverse mix of resources on the grid. So it's not all um, kind of large utility scale projects, um, that's a piece of it, but then there's also, um, you know, uh, rooftop solar um, and, and residential batteries. Um, so what's been really exciting about the storage conversation is just that the, the price of storage has dropped so dramatically so that it's really unlocking um, all kinds of new potential um, for transitioning to 100% renewable energy. Um, because many renewable energy sources are intermittent, right? So they're, they're not on all the time. Um, whereas a fossil fuel plant, you know, you can keep that running and providing power um, on a 24-7 basis. Um, so by having things like large storage farms, we can, we can store renewable energy for um, use, you know, after the sun goes down, um, which just unlocks um, a, a whole suite of, of possibility. Um, and, and, and it's more cost effective than it's ever been. We have a very interesting problem here in Hawaii now, where in the middle of a sunny day, all those solar panels out there are actually producing too much electricity. What does that mean? It means that the electric power plants can throttle back only so much, just like a car can idle only so slowly. If it goes slower than that, it, uh, it dies. So we don't want that. So the Utilities scale back as much as they can. There's still too much PV power. And that is when I believe you're referring to put that excess power in those storage batteries because what happens to electric demand in this state once the sun goes down? Around yeah. five in the afternoon. Right, it ramps up, right? Everyone's coming yeah. home from work. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it, very, yeah, it's been interesting um, to see some shifts in that um, because of the COVID-19 um, pandemic when more, more folks are working from home. But generally um, in, in the evening, um, that's when folks are, are using the most power. Um, and that, you know, what you talked about, uh, you know, kind of having so much, uh, you know, the abundance of renewable energy is, is so, um, so prominent here in, in Hawaii and, and we're really lucky to have that, but it creates a unique challenge for us in particular um, because our, you know, our, each of our islands is an isolated um, uh, electricity grid. So in, um, in states on, on the continent, they can, 
then to offload that excess uh, excess power to um, you know places on the regional grid. But in Hawaii, we really have to to um, to balance that load, um, which creates a um, a unique uh, challenge here in Hawaii, or something that I I know other states are 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 looking at at how we're managing that. But we can also do, in addition to storing um, that uh, renewable energy and batteries, we, we can also explore things like producing hydrogen um, with that excess renewable energy. And that locks a whole nother suite of, of possibilities, right? Because we can use that hydrogen, which is um, would be renewably produced um, um, in our, our gas pipelines and then also for uh, transportation, uh, and particularly large vehicles. So, um, yeah, a lot of opportunity. A lot of opportunities. And looking down the road with uh, regard to the utilities, I don't know if there's legislation on the table right now or if the Public Utilities Commission is considering this, but there's a little phenomenon that utilities can do called time of use pricing. Do you know anything about time of use pricing? Yeah, yeah, and and we think that's a really a really smart strategy and something mm -hmm. that um, the utility has looked at, um, and and we hope to see additional conversation there as well. Um, you know, that goes back to what we were talking about. Um, you know, with, charging your electric vehicle um, during the day. So this mm -hmm. is time of use rates are really about um, you know aiming to shift behavior um, and sending price signals um, to customers to encourage that behavior shift so that we're um, you know, we're, we're really using energy um, at, at the best times of day that are going to be helpful for this uh, transition to 100% renewable energy. And as I understand it, the best time or the strongest solar time is, say, between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. And if you had time of use uh, pricing, wouldn't you make electricity, wouldn't you set the rate for electricity really cheaply during that time? And then when you have your peak load, wouldn't you make electricity more expensive? And people will say, well, we can't do anything about that, but consider your typical residence, which has maybe a dishwasher, clothes washer, and a dryer. And there's a brand new invention called timers. Couldn't you put your dishwasher timer on to go on at uh, 1030 in the morning, your clothes washer to go on at noon, and your dryer to go on at uh, 130 in the afternoon? Wouldn't that be a, a solution? Yes, that would be fantastic. And I think it would be even better if it was all automated, right? So it's not, not even something that you have to think about, um, mm -hmm. you know, but, but your appliances and the way that they're, they're set up to run are actually helping uh, helping the grid and helping us uh, achieve 100% renewable energy, mm -hmm. um, and that that happens too on the EV charging side. As as an example, um, I have a, a Nissan Leaf, and I live in an apartment building, so I don't have um, home charging. So I rely on the public charging network, um, and there's a, a fast charger um, on Ward Avenue at Hawaiian Electric that I that I use often, um, and and the um, cost to charge your vehicle um, is, is cheaper, as you said, um, you know, during those uh, non-peak hours. So it's actually uh, cheaper to charge my car um, on solar um, than it is on, on fossil fuels in the evening. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that interesting little word, price. When we look at all utility options, traditionally, we made electricity, this is as a nation now, made electricity with coal and with nuclear. And here in Hawaii, we still get the dominant share of our electricity from oil. What is happening to the cost of producing electricity by natural gas, oil, or coal versus producing electricity via sunlight or by wind energy. I think there's something happening to the price points here. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's uh, shifted, right? So 
Um, Mm -hmm. Now, renewable energy and solar plus storage um, has emerged as, um, you know, the cheapest source source of energy. Um, And it's cheaper to pursue renewable energy options than it is in fossil fuel, um, than it is to pursue fossil fuel options. Um, and, and that's something, I mean, it's, it's very layered and, and complex, but it's something that, um, you know, we've had some awareness about um, in Hawaii, considering, as you said, that we import so much of our fuel, um, the most oil dependent uh, state in the country, um, and, and we're making that transition, um, you know, but that's all money that's leaving the state, right? So, um, you know, we're, we're paying to import that fuel, whereas uh, renewable energy um, is homegrown. Um, so we're able to keep that money and keep those jobs for developing those projects in state. And you mentioned another very interesting word, namely jobs. We just now, th- thanks to the COVID, we went from having the lowest unemployment rate in the nation to the highest. We were well over 20% there back in March. And we have since regrown the economy so that our unemployment is down, quote unquote, to I believe it's 9.5%, which is still much, much too high. Is there any correlation between all these renewable sources plus storage correlating with job creation, as in creation of skilled, a skilled workforce? Yeah, th- this is something that we've been thinking a lot about at Blue Planet and um, actually motivated us to put out our Waypoints report, which I, I, I think you've seen, Howard. Um, it's available on uh, waypointshawaii.org. So um, it's Blue Planet um, thoughts about 50 actions that Hawaii can take um, to recover from the pandemic, um, but doing so in a way that's equitable, that promotes resiliency, um, and, and also uh, addresses the climate crisis that we're in. Mm-hmm. Um, so we saw the need, you know, thinking about the economic um, hardship that um, we've experienced and are still really in the throes of, um, you know, we, we saw the need to, to change the conversation um, a- around our, our climate future and really, really pulling out the, uh, the opportunities that can both help us create jobs and foster economic growth, but that are also moving us in the right direction um, on tackling climate change. So part of that report was really looking at what are the opportunities um, to create jobs, certainly in renewable energy, um, but then also in, in things like energy efficiency, which I um, you know, know that you uh, care a lot about as well. And um, there's just enormous potential um, in our built infrastructure um, to capture savings, to reduce our energy consumption um, and, and create jobs in, in energy efficiency and retrofitting for buildings. Yeah. And consider the fact that a lot of the people, well, much of the unemployment is due to the tourist or visitors, visitor sector, where we only have about 20% as many visitors as we did as recently as, as a year ago. And a lot of those people who are employed by the industry are young people. And when you're young, you're flexible and you're open to acquiring new skills. So isn't there a possibility, and this is something that the energy office is working on also, of giving training opportunities to these young people who are currently unemployed to go from the visitor sector to the renewables and the efficiency uh, sector. Yes, um, absolutely. And you know, this is something that Hawaii has been, been grappling with for a long time, thinking about um, mm-hmm. how do we meaningfully transition our economy and kind of um, you know, disentangle it from um, being so heavily relied on the visitor industry. Um, so we see this as a really critical moment to to move forward in that conversation. We've been having that conversation for a long time, um, but this is the moment to do it. And there are so many opportunities um, in um, the climate, renewable energy, energy efficiency space that we see that as, as, um, as the key to helping us um, really move in that direction. So we, Blue Planet does a lot of work um, with youth, uh, particularly at the high school level 
there's just so much enthusiasm uh, for them to be part of this uh, clean energy conversation. Um, so uh, we work with them and um, help them uh, learn about the field and, and then also kind of jumpstart their interest in uh, career opportunities. And there are um, other organizations and um, the energy office and others really working at you know, connecting those dots between that interest and then getting people to actually you know, sign up to, mm -hmm. to be part of that field because that's, a, that's an important bridge, right? That we have yeah, to cross. Yeah. It's not just saying, um, here's the jobs, um, you know, aren't these interesting, but getting um, youth um, and, and young people really excited about those careers and seeing them as, um, as a long-term career option. Plus the little fact that these are skilled positions they would be trained in, and generally speaking, skilled positions have pretty good salaries. But we have only three minutes left and a question has come in and you can choose not to answer this <laughs> Great. wish. The question is, will Hawaiian or will the rail project run on electricity? And by inference, if so, where in the world is this electricity going to come from? Because when you start these big heavy rails up, you're going to have an enormous surge of electricity. Yeah, um, and I, you know, I don't know. I know that Hawaiian Electric has thought a lot about this, so I, I won't um, kind of, uh, you know, butcher the the planning that they've um, been doing. Um, but it certainly will um, create additional uh, electricity load. Um, but it's it's kind of part of this whole this whole pie, right? So there's mm -hmm. other um, ways that we're on a system basis um, reducing energy efficiency, also reducing. Um, you know, the hope is that the rail will really provide a, um, a public transportation option that hasn't been, uh, you know, convenient and available um, for many folks um, on the island. Um, so that's going to reduce, um, you know, the need for, for transportation um, fuel to fund individual, uh, you know, personal um, passenger vehicles. So um, it's really kind of taking a, a careful, um, holistic approach. Um, and I, I know that folks are doing that and we're happy to, to be part of that conversation and great that, that folks are connecting the dots um, on all of the, the different parts of the system because we, we have to manage it all and work together. And as a final thought, let me put this all together, even though we're going to have, uh, we're going to have hopefully 100% electric vehicles all this electricity used by the rail, especially when the, the cars start up again, our vision, by that I mean Blue Planet plus uh, Hawaii Energy Office plus a whole lot of other folks, our vision is to have 100% of that high energy, high electricity demand supplied by solar, wind, maybe hydrogen, and other clean sources. Is that a good summary, Melissa? You've got about 30 seconds to wrap up. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful summary. And it's actually the law, right? Um, so we have mm -hmm. to figure out how to do that um, because we've set that mandate for the state and we're going to figure out how to do it. Um, and yeah, it's really wonderful that, that so many members of the community are part of this conversation mm -hmm. because it, it really is about all of us. Mm -hmm. um, so at Blue Planet, we're, we're always happy to, to chat with folks that are interested about this and um, particularly getting involved in the legislative session. So you can visit our website to learn more about how to do that. Because that's a big, powerful lever that we can use to, to create the future we want. And what would they Google to get your website? Uh, Blue Planet Foundation um, mm -hmm. is good. Hopefully we'll, we'll pop up on... Um, Climate and clean energy nonprofit Hawaii also, um, but blueplanetfoundation.org um, is where to go to, to find out about our work and how to get involved. And on that cheery note, we must bid fond adieu. Melissa Mashiro, Managing Director, Blue Planet Foundation, thank you so very much. It's been a very, very enlightening conversation, Melissa, and look forward to conversations in the future. Likewise, Howard, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Bye-bye. Okay.